When African people were taken into sl slavery from the west coast of Africa, and quiet as it's kept, we are now understanding that maybe close to 30% of the slaves taken from, from the, uh, the Guinea coast of West Africa were Muslims. Close to 30%. In Bahia, in Brazil, which was the largest slave population created by the Portuguese, there was a huge slave revolt in Bahia. A successful slave revolt to the point where the Hausa and the Fulani or the Fula people who, 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 were the, who were taken into slavery in that part of the world were able to defeat the Portuguese. They were given boats and they returned to West Africa. And you can go to Lagos today and you can find Brazilian mosques, which is, which, which is a mosque, a house of worship built by people who were captured, taken to Brazil, and then won their liberation and returned to West Africa. You also find that in Suriname, the Bush Blacks led a great revolt. And if you go to the interior of Suriname today, you will find African people who are our free people, who fought for their liberation. One of the leaders in this revolt, his name was Arabi, and his general was Zamzam. Zamzam is water in Mecca that the Muslims drink. It's been flowing from the time of the Prophet Abraham. This is in Suriname. Also you find that in Trinidad, Muhammad Sisei and a number of uh, Muslims who were living, who, who were captured prisoners of war or slaves, were able to get their freedom and actually gain, uh, uh, get property in Trinidad. And they actually had a society going on in the Caribbean. And you find that all over the Caribbean in the writings now, we are reinterpreting the writings and understand, and we understand that when the term Mandingo is being used, they are referring to a Muslim. Mandingo. This is the terminology now. They wouldn't use Muslim because you have to remember that the Spanish were paranoid of Muslims because they were f Muslims were in Spain for 700 years. And so the, the, the Spanish had to overtake the Muslims in Andalusia, right? Seville, Toledo, Granada, Cordoba. So they didn't want to hear the words Muslim. They wanted to erase it. They just baptized everybody on the boat. And, and so nobody could use it, especially the Muslims. But still, records are coming to us. In 1821, in the Manchester parish of Jamaica, a document was being passed around which is called Wathiqa. Wathiqa. It was written in Arabic. This is a document which is now being linked by Nigerian scholars to a document written by a West African Islamic reviver of the faith. His name was Sheikh Uthman Denfodio of the Fula, Fulani people. He wrote a document which was called Wathika ibn, ibn Fudi ila ahl sudan wa man sha'allahu min al-ikhwan. This document says it is the document or manifesto of the son of a scholar, Ibn Fudi, to the people of the Sudan, meaning right across West Africa, uh, you know, to the Sudan today, and those whom Allah pleases from the brethren, meaning his students or talaba. This document, Wathika, was calling the people to resistance. Resistance. At that time, it was against the petty Hausa kings who, who were oppressing people in uh, Gobea and other parts of Hausa land. There was a revolt, uh, a resistance that went on in the time of Sheikh Uthman, rahimahullah. What happened now in Jamaica, and the link is being made now, uh, uh, Dr. Usman Bugaje one of the uh, uh, scholars in, um, in northern Nigeria today. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Usman last summer in Leicester in UK. And he gave me this paper and he, he, he linked it. They were linking it together now. The Wathika of Ibn Fudi, they're linking it with the document passed around amongst the slaves in Jamaica. And sure enough, in 1821, there was a slave revolt in the Manchester parish. You also find in Bahamas, I went to the archives in, in, in Bahamas and Nassau, and I was surprised to read in one of the documents that it said that um, a certain amount of slaves were, were, were taken to the island of Exuma, and uh, a large number called themselves followers of Mahomet. Now, they didn't know what this term Mahomet was, M-A-H-O-M-E-T. This is the crusading middle age definition for the word Mohammed. These people in the Bahamas were defining themselves as Muslims. And so Muslims were one of the groups, one of the groups who resisted 
oppression and slavery in the Americas. Resistance to slavery and tyranny in any form. That is the essence of Islam. That is the root definition of the terminology. And this is what has existed throughout the world. That is the reason why in the Muslim world today there is turmoil. That is the reason why you see it in the press. Because neo-colonial powers were put into place in the Muslim countries. That when the colonial system left, a person was put into place who spoke the same language as the people, looked like them, but he was worse than the colonial master. He was worse. And this is what the Muslim countries are suffering from today. And so what I want to make you aware of, that you may not be aware of, is that when you are dealing with a country like Sudan, which is a big country, and to go from one end of the Sudan to another, it's, it's like driving from Toronto um, to New Orleans or maybe Brazil. The place is big. I mean, when I, when I would, would drive from Kano, just to get from Kano to Sokoto, those of you who know northern Nigeria, it's like you're driving forever. And if you look at the map, Nigeria is small compared to the Sudan. It's huge. So to try to lump everybody together in one little group, to try to blame one group in Khartoum for something that goes on in another part of the Sudan, you don't understand the country. What you have to understand is that the people there, want, they want to be independent. They are now, in terms of their agriculture, the economy, they do not depend upon foreign powers. They're growing their own food. They, they, there's a serious education that is going on in the Sudan. These are some of the things that you don't see. The Sudan is a refuge in the northern part too. It has been a refuge for people from all over Africa. And if you go there, you will find people from all over Africa. So, you know, when we are defining terms, you have to try to define it from the perspective of the people themselves. I am not here today to cover up any exploiter, any oppressor, who, who in the name of Islam or Christianity or nationalism or whatever it is, oppresses people. I'm not covering them up and I'm not making an excuse for them. What I want to say very clearly is that there is a difference between what Islam stands for as a way of life and what peop certain people have done in the name of Islam who would try to use this international way of life as a means of gaining wealth or exploiting Making these um, uh, statements off of propaganda books and of stereotyping um, which, which has been done uh, you know, in the name of scholarship. So really what I'm saying is, is that um, our understanding here is different because you know you say Arabs, so you're thinking of a, a light-skinned person with a big, with a nose, and then you know the African, whatever these definition, right? This is totally opposite to what it is, man. A, the so-called Arabs can be anything; they can be light-skinned or they can be dark-skinned. It is not a racial group. It's not a racial group. It's a linguistic group and a cultural group. And this is a total misunderstanding. But but because people do not have access. To, to direct information from the Sudan or Africa, they just look at the paper, oh, see those Arabs? They're doing it again. You know, and you develop this theory, so Arnold Schwarzenegger, get them. Chuck Norris, get them. Stephen, go get them. Because they're terrible, right? The Crimson Jihad. Go get them, man. Send the Delta Force and get all them Arabs. This is what is happening, man. It's stereotyping. It's stereotyping, man. You know, and it really has a negative effect uh, on a lot of young people who get confused when they go to Africa and find something different when they, when they go there. I'm studying West African history. And they were saying about, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in West Africa, they are talking about um, the Al Muravids, Al Murabitun. And, and they came in the 11th century, you know, out of um, North Africa and they destroyed the kingdom of Ghana uh, in the 11th century. Then when you look at the records, there's uh, uh, Conrad and Fisher, they put out this article, they call it the conquest that never was. Because when you go back and you read Al-Bakri, and you read the different writings of, of the people who recorded it, the al Muravid, al murabitun they never invaded Ghana. They assisted the king. The king stayed in power after they reached. Now if you invade a country and, and defeat it, the king does not stay in power. You kill the king. The king stayed in power. And all the, all the definitions being used by 
you know, the, 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 the writers of the history were not conquest. But they, again, they want to divide north from south. The Berbers in the north, the Arabs in the north, the Africans in the south. Right? In the same way like here, the light skin, the dark skin. 